Welcome to Section 7, Channel. In this section, we'll be looking at what is a channel, of course, how to declare and use channels. We'll look at how you use functions and channels together, and what does that mean in terms of passing channels to function and returning channels from functions. We'll look at some more advanced uses of channels, and that would include how do we use channels with coroutine. We'll learn that though actually the purpose of channels, this data type that we'll learn about in this section, is really to help us work with Go Routines, and we'll see what's the intent there. We'll also look at channel selection when we talk about channels and Go Routine. All channel selection makes a lot of things very, very nice and introduces us to some concurrency patterns. And we'll also talk about read and write only channels. It doesn't seem to make sense now, but later on we'll see it how it's important that how you might be able to want to just have a channel that somebody can read on data from, or a channel that somebody might only be able to write to. And then finally, we'll wrap up with channels of channels. Every section starts with lecture one. In this lecture, the topics we're going to cover are what is a channel, simple channel usage, and we'll see how to send and receive data on a channel. So what is a channel? This is from the Golang documentation. It says, a channel provides a mechanism for concurrently executing functions. Now, let's stop right there. If you remember, the way we write concurrently executed functions is by creating Go routines, which run those functions. So a channel provides a mechanism for concurrently executed function to communicate by sending and receiving values of a specific element type. This tells us the fact that we see values of a specific element type, that a channel might operate something like a map or an array or a slice in that there's an element type that you must specify, and every value that you send on that channel must be of that element type. Okay, so you can't mix element type. So if you have a channel of int, you can only send int. If you have a channel of strings, you can only send strings. Then it, this last sentence says the value of an uninitialized channel is nil, which means that if you just created a channel variable, it's nil. What then is a channel? Let's see if we can understand this visually first before we write some code. Let's say I add a function one and a function two. And so let's say I have these two concurrent functions and I want function one to generate some data. Maybe it's reading data from a file. Maybe it's just generating random numbers or something like that. And I want to get that information into function two. Now, the way we saw we can do that in the previous section is by using a shared data structure, like a map or something like that. But if we instead introduce a channel, what we can do is say that function one sends that data through the channel to function two or whoever is going to receive on the other end of that function. So here function one is the sender, it sends data into the channel, and function two is the receiver. And what we can imagine also is that if our channel is big enough, as I'm trying to illustrate here, we can send multiple pieces of data and we should expect function two to receive the first piece of data that was sent into the channel. So this is usually referred to a FIFO, which means first in, first out. The data that is in first into that channel comes out first, which makes sense, right? You'd expect that if you join a line, the person up front should be service first. If I change the name slightly from just function one to producer and function two to consumer, you can see how this general idea can be extended where you can just decouple two pieces of code. And any piece of code that sort of produces data that another piece of code need to consume or work on, you can use channel, especially if they are running concurrently, to decouple exactly how they communicate. And that decoupling gives you the advantage now of being able to have multiple producers right into the same channel and potentially have multiple consumer consume from the same channel. And this is a huge advantage because it means that you can easily scale your application. And channel takes care of how to move that data between producers and consumers. And all your producers care about is that it's writing into the common channel and your consumer data is care about reading data from that same common channel. And you don't have to worry about which one received what data and all this other stuff. So a lot of things are taken care of for you. And we'll see that in a bit. This gives us a nice visual illustration that we can now go and try and write some code. Here I am in my video studio code editor. The first thing we want to do is look at how you declare channels. And for that, we simply 
use the var keyword and say we want to create a variable named channel ch and it's the type of it this is the type remember in go we have var keyword variable name or identifier and then the type and in this case the type simply says i want a type that is channel int but remember an uninitialized channel is nil if we were to print out our channel value the length of our channel because remember that picture i showed you it looked like a channel could have length how many things you could put in there and there's capacity which we haven't talked much about we talk a little bit of capacity when we talk about slices we'll see how channels also have capacity and from the word capacity you probably get the hint that maybe length and capacity are independent that the length of a channel would be different than the capacity of a channel and we'll we'll see that as we go through the example let's compile our program and run it and what we should expect let's understand what we should expect we should expect a nil value for this and the length should be zero because there's nothing in there it's sort of taking length on a nil map or a nil slice it shows zero and the capacity of course should be zero so let's run our code and like we expect channel is nil the length is zero and the capacity is zero let's talk now about sending data to a channel and so this is the way in which you send data to a channel you simply have the channel name on the left hand side and you use this left pointing arrow so you're saying take this value four and send it to the channel now i have three codes enable fonts enable for my editor and so that's why you see this less than dash looks like a left pointing arrow so let's try and run our code and see what happens now if we think about it this should, we should expect this to fail and the reason why we should expect it to fail is because we have a nil channel and that's exactly what happened we see that it fails it says all go routines are asleep don't worry about that but the real problem here is we're trying to send to a nil channel we'll talk more about deadlock as we go on in this um, section we know that we cannot send to a nil channel that fails so let's comment this out now receiving from a channel is simple you simply put the channel on the right side of that left point in the arrow now right now we're not saving the value so this is saying take out from the channel whatever value is in it so let's run our code and see and again it tells us that oh we're deadlocked but again, we're trying to receive from a nil channel. We saw that our sending to a nil channel fail and also receiving from a nil channel fails. Makes sense. Let's now look at how we create a channel that we can send and receive from. And one of the easiest channel we can make is an unbuffered channel. And the way we make an unbuffered channel is simply by using the make function and we tell it the type and we'll assign it to the channel variable we already have. So now that we have this, we can go back, grab this, and say, let's print it out and see now what's the difference. We should expect that our channel variable here should not be nil, and we should expect that the length of the channel should be zero still because we haven't put anything in it, and we'll see about the capacity. So let's go run the code. Well, I think that I did not comment out my receive code, so let's comment that out. Save, and let's go back and rerun. Oh, and there we go, right? So before we had a nil channel, length of zero, capacity zero, and now we have a non-nil channel whose length is also zero because we didn't send anything into it, and capacity is zero. And that's why this channel is on buffer. It has no capacity for us to queue things up. Think of the capacity of the channel as how many things element of the type you define you can queue up into this channel so by default when you create a channel like this it's an unbuffered channel there's no place for buffering or queuing up things so what happens then if we try to send into this unbuffered channel we should expect this to fail and the reason why even though we have a valid channel it's not nil there's no place to send anything but the reason this fail is because on the other side of this channel there's no one to receive anything so you can make an unbuffered channel, but it must have someone else or another go routine, a concurrent function that is ready to receive. And we do not have that. I want you to keep this in mind. You must have on the other side of an unbuffered channel, a receiver that is ready to receive. If 
the receiver is not ready to receive, then you wouldn't be able to send. And we'll learn more about this in a few more lectures, but just keep that in mind. So this will fail. And so we see it all, we get deadlock. Notice it's not telling us that what we're trying to send on a nil channel, we have a valid channel to send on, but we're deadlocked because while we're trying to send, remember we're the only go routine that's running right now. We're trying to send on this valid channel. There's no one else receiving, so we're blocked from sending. What about if we try to receive now from a valid unbuffered channel? And again, we should expect this to fail because if we comment out this line, because we know it will fail there, what is going to happen? We're going to be trying to receive a value from a valid channel, but there's no other go chain ready to send a value to us on that channel. And similarly, our one go routine that's created to run the main function will be blocked waiting for a value on this channel, this valid channel, but there will be no other go routine in our application running because we have not created another go routine and therefore we will terminate also. But let's see that. And so notice now how we failed on trying to receive, not on a nil channel, just simply because we're also deadlocked. So, so far, it doesn't look like we can use on buffer channel because they're not very useful when you just have one go routine. So what we really want to do is create a buffer channel, which is a channel with some capacity, and therefore we can at least put some value in it without our program crashing. This is how you make a buffer channel. You simply specify a second parameter, which is the capacity. So right now, what we're doing is making a new channel of int. This second parameter is just the capacity of the channel. So when we run this, we should still expect to see a non-zero value, which is probably the memory location for this channel. Um, we should see a length of zero because we haven't placed anything in that channel, but the capacity, how many things we can maximally store in this channel should be one. And so let's run this. And that is exactly what we see. So what about when we send a value now? So notice how oh, we're sending a value to a buffer channel. We should be able to send our value two into the channel because we have a capacity of one. We don't need a receiver to be waiting and ready to receive this value because it can be queued up. That's what the purpose for the buffer is how many values I can send before I cannot send anymore. Okay. Or I need a receiver to be there to receive. And so in this case, we can send one value and we should expect that after we send this one value, we should see one and one because our capacity will never change once we create that channel, but the link will change depending on how many values we have sent uh, into that channel or we still have in the channel. And this is what we see. We send two into the channel. And so our length is one, our capacity is one. And of course we should expect that if we now receive the value from this channel, that our length should go back down to zero because we've read the value out of that channel. And this time we're going to read the value from the channel and store it in this variable V. And then now we will print out that this is the very first value from that channel. And so we get our value two. Now we've read one value and that tells us here that our channel is again empty because the length is zero and our capacity is one. So our channel is now empty. There's nothing else to read from this channel. So if we try to read another value, we should expect that our, we should again be blocked and our program will die. So I wouldn't try that because it's just back to what we've shown before. If we try to send multiple values though into this channel, we should see that the first one should succeed because we've sent a value before, we've removed it, we've sent it, now we're sending again. And if we try to send a second value, now it should fail because the channel is full. So we run this exactly what happened. We again fail to send that value. If I comment out this line, you'll see that our, our program will run successfully because we sent a value, receive it, and then we send another value. So our channel was empty. We sent a value in. It's one. We receive it. And now we can send another value. So we couldn't send on a nil channel and you can't send into a channel that's full. And of course, if we want to send multiple values before we are blocked, what we can do is simply make a bigger channel. And so we make a channel with more capacity. This time our capacity is two. And so we should expect that we can send these two values into our channel and our program should run successfully. So let's test that. And there you go. Our length is two, capacity is two. And so now our channel is full. If we try to send a third value, then of course, we should expect that our program should again crash because 
it's full. If we receive from our channel the two values we sent into it, we should expect to get two and three back as our first and second value. And this is what we get. We get first value, second values, um, two and three. And then if we try to receive a third value, then we should expect our program fail also because there's no other go routine that can send a value for us. And so that's exactly what happened. The last thing I want to show you, read and write only channel. And this might not make much sense, but just imagine that I create a channel. And in this case, I will create a channel, channel of strings. And so I've created a channel of strings. Now, we haven't talked about it yet, but imagine that I wanted, not I have this channel of string of capacity five, and the capacity doesn't really matter for what I want to show. But imagine that I had a piece of code here that was only supposed to write into this channel because I wanted to give it to a concurrent function that only produces data. So since the concurrent function only produces data, I only need to give it a channel that it can write into. So I might call this the input channel. So let's do, so I might create another channel, which I'll call out because that's all the producer code needs to do is to write to that channel. And what I want to say though, is that it's a channel that you can only write data into. So how do I say that you can only write data into this channel is I do this. And so what this says is out is a channel that you can send data to. Okay, that's my channel. And I can initialize out. So since I already have a channel CH that can do both in and out, well, if I assign to out CH, because right now out is just nil. So if I uh, uh, assign to out CHS, and so now I can use out to send data to it. I've sent two string values to my channel out because this channel is only capable of putting data on this channel. That's all I can do with out. Uh, if I try to read from out, I'll get an error. Trying to receive from send only channel. So I can call this write only or send only. I should probably call it send only channel, receive only. Okay. That would be the variable that I would pass to my producers to make sure that their intent is reflected clearly that they're only supposed to write to this channel. In this case, I want to create a receive only variable. So same thing, I do var in, so say it's well, only gonna get things in from this channel or it's a read only channel. And so I say channel and it's gonna be a channel of string. But where should this arrow be? Well, when the arrow is between channel and string, you could read it as, you're going to send string into it because it shows like string can only go into that channel. The key, the answer is this. What we're saying is in is a variable that can only receive from this channel of string. When I have this, I can say I can read from in. And again, I have another value I can read from in. And using the in variable, I should be able to now read the values from this channel because remember, well, oh, I need to assign in. I did not assign in. In is nil right now. So I assign it the same channel that I created. Notice I initialize out with this channel I created. I initialize in with the exact same channel. But this piece of code, since it's using this variable, that's a write-only variable or send-only variable, it can only send. And this piece of code can only use in to receive only. And so let's run this and we'll see. And so there we go. I got my output because I use this receive only variable and I can only use out as send only. This doesn't make a lot of sense, but just imagine that all these were concurrently executing functions and I, this is the type of variable I pass to them to make sure that they don't do anything else but send. And this is my consumer functions, concurrent functions, and they can only receive from that channel. That's it in terms of declaring channel and using them. For this lecture, you do not have an exercise. Look at a supplemental video that goes over a review of this lecture. Other than that, take care. See you in the next video. Bye. Welcome to lecture two in section seven. And in this lecture, we'll be looking at how you can close a channel and the effects of closing a channel. That is, what happened when you try to send on a closed channel? What happened when you try to receive on a closed channel? So of course, we have a few topics we're going to cover. And that's going to revolve around working with a closed channel, like I said, testing for a channel that is closed, and 
we are also going to look at the range operator because one we want a nice efficient way of it's written over the values in a channel so far we just see receiving one value at a time and then we want to see what happens with a closed channel versus an unclosed channel when you use the range operator let's jump to the code so here i am in my video studio code editor I made my channel with a capacity of two and i'm sending only one string value into that channel and now i want to see what happens if my channel still has capacity, I, but I close the channel. So I use the close function to close the channel. And now just print out some information about the channel. So what should we expect? Well, when we print out the channel before, if there were values in it, well, we just see that with a non-nil channel, we'll see that memory address, but we didn't really see anything else. And then the length tell us how many values are in the channel and the capacity. But we didn't see anything about whether it's closed or open. So let's run our code and see if we see anything different now. And just as before, we just have the memory address, like I said, and the one value we put in the channel with our capacity. So still no indication that our channel is actually closed versus when we did it before we never closed the channel. So what about now that our channel is closed, what happened if we try to send another value into the channel? And we might imagine or guess that oh, this shouldn't work because we, even though we have a capacity of two and there's certainly place in the channel for another value, the fact that we've closed it means that oh, we've expressed some sort of intent about how the channel should operate when it's closed. And there we go. Our program crashes because it tells us that it panics, that we could not send to a closed channel. And notice this has nothing to do with any deadlock or anything. This is simply the channel is in a state in which you cannot send to it because it's closed. Now we want to talk about what happened when you try to receive from a closed channel. So once again, I make another channel. So I'm not using the same channel as before. And this time I'll send one value to the channel. I'll close it, trying to receive a value and store it in S. And this time I'll print out the channel and so on as before. And again, we should expect that our channel length at this time should be zero because we've received the value and so on. So let's see. And just as we expect, we get the one value that we send into the channel. Our channel length is zero because we've received the value of one value that was sent into the channel. And so let's ask ourselves, what happened if we try to receive from this channel again? Remember, we're trying to receive a second value from a closed channel. Let's recap real quick. In the previous lecture, we saw that if you have a channel, you try to receive from it. If that channel is empty, you will be blocked from receiving because there's nothing in the channel and that go routine will be waiting. Now, if you don't have another go routine on the other side that could possibly send, then your program dies. But let's assume that you have multiple go routines running in your program. Well, it will simply be blocked waiting for a value to come in that channel. But now we have a closed channel. Just as we have expressed intent that when the channel is closed, we shouldn't send any value. Well, is it the case then that when our channel is closed, that we should also fail when we try to receive from that channel? Remember, the fact that it's closed means that no other value will ever be sent. So let's run our code now and see what happens. And our program doesn't die. As you can see, we receive a second value from that channel. We did not send an empty string. That is what we're printing out here, an empty string. Our channel length is still zero, just as before. And this is a second value. And we can keep receiving values on this channel and we'll still get a zero value. What happens when you receive from a closed channel is that your program doesn't block. What happens is you get the zero value of that type. So since we're using string, the zero value of the type is an empty string. Now, this is kind of disturbing because what if we had sent an empty string? How would we be able to tell the difference between sending an empty string and receiving an empty string or the zero value from a channel that's closed? So we need some way to be able to tell that this value that we were reading from the channel was placed there before the channel was closed versus a value that we're receiving because it's the zero value and the channel is closed. So again, I'll make a channel this time of capacity 10. I'll send two values into the channel. I'll close it and then I'll try and re read from this channel. Now we expect this to work. The only difference between how I'm reading now is that I have a Boolean variable. When I read from the channel, I'm asking it to give me two values. I'm asking it to give me the value from the channel and then a Boolean that I send two value in, I'm going to read two value and we print out the value and the Boolean value. 
and you can see I have high and howdy which are the two values I sent and okay telling me at all hey these two values were sent before the channel was closed so we should expect that if I try to read a third value from this channel I don't have it I'll get an empty string and I should get false telling me at all this value that you're reading wasn't sent before the channel was closed and we can see that here now I get an empty string and my OK value is false now I want to test what happens if you keep reading from a channel that you don't close. And we've seen this already. We've, this is the first thing we've played with. The only thing that's different is now we're doing the Boolean read, which is we're asking for the two value when we read from the channel. And so let's run our code. And of course, this works. And so it doesn't matter that we didn't close the channel, we could still ask for the two values. And now we're trying to read a second value but keep in mind we have not closed this channel but this time we're asking for the two value and let's run our program and see what happened and we're deadlocked so it's only when we close a channel then we can keep reading from it even if we we're trying to read from that channel as empty because at that point we can then get the second boolean value tells us something about that value other than that if you don't close a channel it's still as in the previous case where you're going to be waiting on a value from this channel and it makes sense if we didn't close this channel we're saying that somebody could send a value on the channel and therefore since we only have one go routine it makes sense that how we should deadlock and our program should end because we didn't create any other go routine that could possibly send on this channel we know that how this wouldn't work so we should comment this out and now we want to talk about some ways of iterating over a channel value before i do that let's create a channel that's a global variable we'll call ch channel of int and i'll write this function called fill channel fill channel takes two integers it takes the length of the channel you want to create and how many integers to put into that channel so that allows you to create a channel with a capacity larger than the number of integers you want to populate into that channel now that i have my global variable i can call my function fill channel and this time i'm saying create a channel that is capacity 5 and basically fill that channel up and one obvious way of doing this is to simply say let me get the capacity of the channel and iterate over it and print out all the values that are in that channel this assumes that i know that this channel is full so that's one way you can possibly try to empty a channel and so let's run this code and this works as you can see i get the five values that was placed into the channel so let's comment out this code and try something else. here's another example where i have a channel whose capacity is five but it is not full which could be the case right you don't always have to fill up your channel there's just the capacity of the channel and so if i still use the capacity and try to read from this channel we don't have enough values in this channel and so i should expect this program to deadlock and exit because after reading three values we'll try to read a fourth value and it's not there so let's run our code and see and so those are the first three values i will try to read the fourth value at deadlock let's try something else what about if we use the length this tells us how many values are actually in the channel that we can read and so we shouldn't be deadlocked in this case so let's see if this works I'll notice my channel is full here i have a capacity of five i have five values so let's run this code and notice how our program doesn't die but we only get three values so why is that well let's think what's happened the first time we come in we see zero and then we say i is less than length and so i is less than length i is zero length is five and so we iterate i by one and we go we read one value now i is one and i is less than length what is the length remember each time we come around we'll evaluate this expression so length at this time is four but i is one so now we have one less than four is true we go in we read a value from the channel which is our second value we then increment i after this statement after the body so now i is two and we go back and we evaluate this but remember we have read two values from our channel which had five so now i is 2 length is 3 so 2 is less than 3 we go in again read the third value print that out then we increment i so now i is 3 when we evaluate this expression 
now we have only two values left in our channel so length of channel is two so three is not less than two and therefore we do not go back and read more values from our channel so this is certainly bad because we keep evaluating length each time in this for loop so this doesn't quite work our program doesn't crash but it still doesn't work and so if we do that then we get the length before we start iterating and then now we use that variable and now we don't have to worry about this variable l changing over the life of this for loop and so this should work and it does you can see we get our five values so this sort of work but um it doesn't work exactly and the reason why is because as we're in a go routine if we're sitting there reading from this channel the time we calculate what the current length is it might be three elements in there but the next time there might be a little bit more and so we would have read what the length was at that time but then we go or we retrieve the value we'll have to go back and revisit that loop and we'll still have to do something like that we we'll still have to have this idea of keep reading from a channel and we'll learn more about that one of the other things we could do is simply so this kind of works so we'll we'll sort of put this on the side but it's not ideal um, and what we'll do is we'll see if the range operator is smart enough so let's see what an example would look like with the range operator and so notice what we're doing we fill our channel and we're simply using the range operator to range over the channel and return a value if we now run this we get our five values out which is good but notice our program deadlock why did it deadlock well the range operator even though it knows the length of this channel it is still waiting for additional values to come on that channel if you notice before when we did the length well it had no way of knowing if there was more value in the channel even if some more was added immediately after we took the length if in another go routine some value was added before we can execute you know this part of the for loop well we would have missed it the range operator sort of prevents that sort of um, issue by always trying to read from the channel but in this case it is blocked we, because we only have one go routine so this doesn't quite work either so it fails on deadlock i notice this is the exact same code from before only difference is i will now change this to three we should expect this to fail also but i want to show that how the range operator does work if you have less values also it doesn't use the capacity it use actually uses the length let's we have three values and notice it can read as many values as in the channel but we still deadlock so we fail for the exact same reason and we're going to still give the range operator a chance but so far um, there's something that's missing what is actually missing is that if we close the channel because we learned that if a channel is closed you can still keep reading from it without deadlock so after we've used the channel well let's just close it i'll put it out here to make it clear that we're closing the channel after we finish with it and now we still have the same range operator but i know that it's not going to fail because the range operator is smart enough now to see that hey this channel is closed after i read the three values so i need not block waiting for more values and so let's test it and there you go and so this worked really great because now we can put any number of values in this channel and it does not matter it works correctly and we don't have to worry about deadlock and so on so that's the proper way to iterate over a channel in my opinion use the range operator and keep in mind the effect of what close does to a channel in the context of reading values from that channel and especially with a range operator it can safely exit once the, there are no more value in that channel so that's it um, no exercise for this lecture either see you in the next lecture take care have a great day welcome to section 7 lecture 3. so we'll be looking at passing channels to function and what we're interested in finding out is what happens when you pass a channel to a function is it a shallow copy or is it a deep copy and finally we'll look at returning channels from function and of course, based on what we know when we pass a channel to a function, that should sort of inform us of what should happen when we return a channel from our function. Let's jump in and look at some code. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor. What do I have? Well, just a little bit of code. Let's look at this piece of code. I have D is a channel, 
So I make an integer channel of the capacity, my constant, which is 10. And you won't see me do this often, but I want to point it out here and let you know that you should always check the return value from make because make is really just going to call new and try to allocate something on the heap for you, whether it's a slice, a map, a channel. And you should really check and see if it was successful in doing so by checking nil. So um, I just wanted to point that out, but I'm not going to keep doing that. But yeah. And then now I have a producer function, which I haven't written yet. And I pass that channel to the producer. I have a consumer function. And I also pass that channel to those two functions. So let's look at what our producer function looks like. Very simple function. And it produces numbers between one to the channel capacity and random number of integers. And so that's why we were using R before. So now I can sit in my for loop and send some numbers, random numbers between 0 and 199 into the channel. Now notice, once I finish writing numbers to that channel, I close the channel. So the producer is saying, here, I finished using this channel. Do not expect any more numbers. And remember, in the previous lecture, we talked all about closing a channel because if you don't close the channel, you try to use something like a range operator, it reasonably expects that oh, more data could come on that channel. So we're saying here, it's safe to use the range operator because in our case, we only have one go routine. So let's look at our consumer. Our consumer is fairly simple. It simply ranges over that number channel, that nums channel, and print out the number that it can. So we need to bring in our FMT package. And so now we don't have an error in our code and we can run this. And there we go. We, our consumer tells us that we got four numbers and we run this again. We should see that oh, not only we get different numbers, but different sets of numbers because we're determining how many numbers to send as a random number. And so here we got about 10 or something if I look, but that's okay. All right. So that is how easy it is to send numbers to a channel. So what we've seen just now from our output is that when we pass a channel to a function, it is not a deep copy that's being made of the channel. And the way we know that we can just reason that if D had some value and it was a copy of it that was passed into the producer, then when we modify the channel inside of the producer, it would have been a second copy, and therefore, we would not be passing the modified copy to the consumer, but rather this rather empty channel. And the fact that our consumer was able to print out the values from our producer tells us that, oh, it's not a deep copy that we make with a channel. It's operate just like a slice or a map. So this is very, very efficient because it means that you can make very large channels, pass them around to functions. So let's continue. And this time, we want to take a look at how you can create something I'll call a generator. So essentially, what I want is this. Let's look at the code. I want to call a function. I don't pass it any parameter. And that function returns something. And we know it has to be a channel because that same value is what we pass into our consumer function. We have not modified the consumer function. Consumer function expects a channel of ints. So let's write our generator function now. This is all the generator is doing. Makes the channel, returns that channel, produces the data. So if you look at a generator as a block box, you could see it as just this thing where data comes out of it. Gives you a channel and says, here's a channel on which I will send you data. Hopefully you see that the simple change here between the generator and the producer function, function is nothing much. Okay, so let's run our code. And this is, should work exactly in the previous example because all we have done is really just simply move creating the channel into the generator function. That's all. Let's now add on to this idea something that I would call a processor. And you can imagine a processor as a piece of code or a function that takes a channel, reads some data off of it, work on that data, and then produce a channel for that manipulated data. So you could think of it, um, and if you're mathematically inclined, you could think of it as a function where you have input and output. So for this to make sense, let me paste in some other code. The only thing I've added now is this function called counter. Our counter, like the consumer, takes a channel, but notice what it does. It returns a channel also. 
there's nothing that says our counter had to return the same type of channel. So in this case, our counter takes a channel of int and return a channel of int, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. If this counter was doing some conversion, let's say from integer to string, it might take int and return a channel of string. Key thing to really understand here is this, what the counter is really doing is accepting a channel as input and return a channel for output. And because of this, now we can have this sort of mini pipeline where we have a generator that generates some data we pass it through our counter. Okay, so now we need to add the code for our counter. So our counter takes a channel in and copies the element to out. And that's because in this case, we don't really need to manipulate the data on the way through the counter because we simply count in. So we have a variable and loop over the values from the input and then we copy them to the output and then we keep a counter. And notice we make an output channel because we're consuming from that input channel. Let's now run the code and see what we get. And you can see our generator um, generate some random integer or counted, counted how many elements we got and our consumer of course printed it out, okay? So no guessing anymore how many numbers we're producing because we have a counter in the path and it can do some counting for us. So let's extend this a little bit by adding a second processor. Now you'll see that concept come up more many times and people may call it a mapper, but it, the concept is what's important. The only change I've made is now I have a generator. I pass it through a counter and another function, which is another processor call or a mapper if you like, called adder. And its job is to add the number five to every value in the input channel and then of course return a new channel with this modified value and now we pass this to our consumer and so now let's implement our adder and you can imagine the adder wouldn't be much different than the counter and it isn't so here's our adder we make an output channel that ranges over the input value, which is V, and add C, which is the number it needs to add to each value, and send that on the output. Now notice that in this case, we can switch doing the addition first and then the counter. That's because our counter doesn't manipulate the value. So it doesn't matter if it comes before we do addition or after we do addition. But depending on what is it that you're doing, you may not be able to switch, right? And that's going to depend on the task that you problem you're trying to solve. So let's run the code. And there we go. Um, we will have to have something else that sort of printed out our values before we do any addition to see what it is and make sure as how we're doing the correct thing. But I hope based on the simplicity of the code that this is indeed just add in, simply add in the value five. Okay, so that's basically all I want to show you about using functions and channels. So to review, we can pass channels to function. It's a shallow copy. We can return channels from function and we can also do things like closing the channel within the function that we use to generate the data. And this means that anyone who's consuming or the function that consuming from that channel doesn't have to worry about when it's closed or anything. They can use the range operator. You have an exercise for this lecture three. So take a look at the supplemental video that explains what is expected for this exercise. Take care. Bye. See you in the next lecture. Okay. Let's take a look at your exercise for lecture three. So if we go to the exercise directory and we can go to the stop, for example, and we look at our readme, it says, this exercise is to demonstrate multiple producers running sequentially. So we're not using any Go routines yet with channels, and we've learned about Go routines yet, but we're not using it yet. So this is all sequential, not concurrent. So write a complete Golang application to demonstrate multiple producers right into the same channel sequentially. The max messages per producer and the number of producer are specified by the program parameters M and N respectively. So what this means is your application should accept two numbers, which you will then use to determine how many M is the maximum messages per producer. So I'll give you an example just when I run my solution. 
I can say that I want the maximum number of messages per producer to be 10. That's the max. But each producer really produces 1 to M messages, just as we did when we were writing the code in our uh, looking at the lecture. And then N is the number of producers. Okay. All right. So the first to do is to use the flags package, which is a standard package, so that you can parse the minus M value and the minus N argument value when provided. So your Go language provides the flag package for parsing command line options. Hence, you don't need to check OS.args uh, available directly. Okay. By default, you should have M equals to 100 messages max per producer, and you should do three producers. That is, if the user calls your program with no argument, this is what you should use. The program should show user's message for any illegal value. So for example, if a user says that I want to use a negative number for number of messages, that's illegal. So you should print, print out a useful message. And this can be done very easily again by using flags that usage um, function method call on the, the function call on that flags package. Just look at the example and documentation for the flags package and you'll see it's very, very easy to use. Your second to do is to create a channel for string messages at the package scope. Okay. So this is going to be your global variable channel um, that you're going to pass to each producer. Your channel must be capable of holding all of the messages that can be produced, right? Because if you're going to run producer sequentially, you run producer one, producer two, producer three, for example, and each producer could write a maximum of, let's say, a hundred messages, which is the default. It means that my channel capacity, capacity must be a minimum of 300. It doesn't need to be any bigger in this example, because if the maximum message per producer is a hundred and I have three producer, then my maximum channel capacity is just 300. And so you should definitely take that into consideration. And then you will write a producer function and this is how you produce the requirements for your producer function. I would suggest that you go through and sort of implement things one to do at a time and see if get that working um, before you move on to the other. I have specified this application in such a way that if you were to develop it in this way, you should be able to reason about the correctness of your application. And so your producer function simply write messages into that channel. And so it takes as a parameter an ID, and then it generates a message that says something like, I'm producer one, and this is the number I'm generating. And again, it's a random number, and it's between one and M. And finally, you write a consumer. And this is where most of the work really, I think, for this exercise lies. The first bit of work is really in processing the command line using the flags package, but that is so easy. It's really not a lot of work. You can pretty much copy and paste the documentation and modify it. We the example using the documentation. This is where the bulk of the work is for your exercise. And in your consumer, you consume the message and you need to extract the numbers and basically keep track of them so that you can write out the sum and how many messages you got or numbers you got from each producer. And then finally, the total across all messages. Make sense? So print the number of messages and the sum for each producer, and then print the total number of messages sent and total sum across all producers. And so your result will look something like this. If I'm using an example where I have by default three producers, well, you can see producer one said 91 numbers and the sum is 871. Producer two sent 18 numbers and it's total, those total of those 18 numbers, 208. Producer three sent 12 numbers and the sum of that was 113. But across all my producers, the total number of numbers sent is 91 plus 18 plus 12 for a total number of 121 numbers total that my consumers, my consumer processed. And then the total of all those numbers would be the 837 plus 208 plus 113. And that gives me 1,158. So let's take a look at my example solution when it's running. So this is my solution and 
And as you can see, here's producer one, it sent 71 numbers. The total of those 71 numbers was 635 and producer two sent 58 and blah, blah, blah. And you can see the result. And if I run it again, uh, different set of numbers because I'm using a random number generator. Okay, that's your exercise. Try it and then look at the solution if you're stuck. Welcome to section seven, lecture four. In this lecture, we'll be looking at channels and go routine. As we said at the beginning of this section, and the intended purpose of channel is a mechanism to allow go routines to communicate. And what we saw when we tried to use channels with our go routine is that we can have issues with deadlock. For example, if we have a channel that doesn't have any buffering, we cannot send any data because there's no other receiver on the other end. And now to have a receiver, well, we need to be running concurrent code because by default, our Go application has one Go routine. And so it cannot do both trying to send and also trying to receive on an unbuffered channel. So we need more than one Go routine if we're going to use an unbuffered channel. And if we have a buffer channel, well, when we use that one Go routine to be sending into the channel, it eventually is going to be unable to send and it's going to be blocked on sending. And therefore we have no receiving go routine and vice versa. If we try to do a receive, we can play the whole thing backwards and see the same problem. Not this is not to say that with go routines, once we introduce go routines with channel that we would never have deadlock, but we should see that once we have running go routines, we're going to be able to send and we're going to be able to receive. And so we shouldn't. And if you have, deadlock in your program, that means that somewhere or the other, you have a go routine that is exited or all your go routines are blocked or you don't have enough of them or something like that. Okay, so just to recap, before we jump into any sort of code, what we know, we know that if we have a channel and this in this example, it's a buffer channel and we have a sender sending data into that channel. Eventually, let's imagine that our receiver dies for some reason, the go routine that's managing our receiver exited, for example, or is unable to receive any data, the channel is eventually going to be filled up by that sender. And then the sender is going to be blocked. It's not going to be able to send any data because like we said just now, there's no receiver on the other end. We can look at the receiving side, how you block on a buffer channel. And similarly, if you have a sender sending data into that channel, and for some reason, your sender fails or is busy or cannot send any more data for whatever reason, eventually the receiver is going to drain all the data out of that buffer channel, and then it will be blocked from receiving. Now we know that oh, there is a special case if you close the channel, then your receiver doesn't block, right? And this problem only becomes more acute when you have unbuffered channel. So if you're trying to send an unbuffered channel, you require to have both sender and receiver go routines be able to run in order to send that data and receive the data. And if, for example, the receiver go routine cannot, well, then you block immediately without being able to send any value because your channel is unbuffered. There's no space there to store any value. And the same exact same thing, if you use an unbuffered channel, how do the receiver can be blocked if the sender is unavailable. Let's recap our serial function execution. So we have a function one, function two, and time going down the screen. If we call function one, we know how we enter function one, well, it runs all its statement and then return before we can run function two. Well, we found that with go routines, we can do concurrency. And concurrency is a pattern that allows us to interleave the execution of our functions. So even when you call function one and function two and they're running concurrently, what can happen is a few statements from each function get to run over time. And this gives the appearance of both functions running at the same time. We said that what you get if you can write concurrent code, use concurrency patterns, is that you get parallelism for free if you have multiple processors. What happens when we introduce channels into concurrency? Well, if we have a channel, and you could think of the channel sitting between the producers and consumers, because remember, the very nature of writing concurrent code, we said that our producer and consumer are decoupled but something they need to communicate, like our producers producing data that needs to get to the consumer. And so a channel allow us a nice way of doing this. And we can have our producer run for a little bit, put some data into the channel, but because this is concurrent code, at some point, let's just assume one processor, 
our consumer will get to run and retrieve that data out of the channel. And again, the producer will get to run and put some more data into that channel and the consumer will get to pull it out and back and forth and we don't need to think about it. A channel, you can just keep this running indefinitely. They can keep running literally forever so long as the producer is able to write data and the consumer is able to receive data. So this is a simple piece of code and we are not in our Visual Studio Code editor, but I still want to still give you a picture. So let's look at this code. Now I've stripped out a lot of things and we're gonna see the details of what we need to make sure that this work fun functions correctly. But for now, let's just look at line six where we've created a channel, there's an unbuffered channel, and because we can assume that on line seven and eight will create producers and consumer goal routines, well, they're gonna be able to run. So our goal routine for the producer would be trying to write into this channel CH. And our goal routine that's run the consumer function, well, it's gonna be trying to read out of it. And because they're both able to run and go routines, well, just for as long as our program needs to run, they're gonna be able to send and consume data. Now again, I left out the details for our consumer and producer function because it doesn't really matter. We can simply imagine our producer is just pushing integer values into that channel and our consumer is taking them out, printing them, summing them, counting them, doesn't really matter. And so if we try and imagine what's going on, we know that with when we start our application, we get one go routine, which is running our main function. And that main function is going to create a second go routine for our producer and a third go routine for the consumer. This sets the stage for our producers to start producing data and it needs somewhere to send it and that's where the channel is used for. And because the consumer would be reading from that channel, well, and it's being executed by a separate Go routine, we can see that how they will always be able to send and receive data. So here are my Visual Studio code. I'm in section seven. Let's start by seeing how we might use a producer and consumer function without concurrency. And again, we will be using a channel, but we'll see now how this works without concurrency. So if you look at our producer, you'll see that what I have is a variable n that's being initialized by some random number. Each time I call my producer, these are the number of messages then that I will send on the channel. So what does a message look like that we send on the channel? I use the FMT sprintf package, which is to do a formatted string, but instead of writing it out to the standard output, the S means return a string. I'll be counting the message. So you should expect to see producer one, item one, for example, up to how many messages I can send. And of course, once my producer finished sending messages, well, it should close that channel. Our consumer simply consume messages from that channel. What does our consumer do? Remember, these are running one after the other serially. So first the messages are produced, the channel is closed, then the consumer consume the message. And so our consumer simply counts the number of messages. After it finished consuming all that value, we know this range operator will end because we are closing our channel and our producer. Then if it didn't receive any value, it says, well, no data was received and it returned. If it receives some value, well, then it tells you how many item it was it processed from that channel. So a very simple piece of code. Let's run it and see it in action. And in this case, we had no message received. We can run it again. We have one, okay, two. So this is okay. I mean, we are able to send messages between our two functions, but there's no concurrency here. We cannot keep producing messages, right? So let's see what is, it happens when we introduce some concurrency into our application. Here's the updated code. So the only change I've made is I'm still making a channel, a buffer channel, but this time I'm asking that my producer be run by a go routine. And my consumer, well, it's gonna be run by the go routine that's running our main application. So we can keep track. We can say now that our application started with one go routine, it creates a second one to run the producer, and our first go routine that's running main, well, that's gonna be running our consumer function. So we should expect then that concurrently the producer is sending data and the consumer is receiving it. And we have no data that time for 
messages, three, and so on. So no different from how we were running it before. So you really couldn't tell the benefit here of running things with having a concurrent producer. Let's see if we can make a slightly more interesting example with Go routines and channels. So what I've done? Well, I've commented out our previous code and that's just so it, our output is not sort of messy with too much of our older example as we progress through. So that's why I'm commenting out and adding new code. So the only new thing I've done is now I've made a channel that is not buffered. Notice on line three, it looks very similar. Sorry, um, my editor line numbering is very, is relative. So here on line 24, this is actually line 24. You can see that it looks very similar to line 30, except on line 30, I am not creating a buffer channel. So this is an unbuffered channel. And if we remember that if you have an unbuffered channel, you must have producers and consumer ready, go routine able to run in order for them to communicate. And let's run this. This is interesting. Our program died panic because we have an integer divide by zero. And we can look and see where this is coming from. It says main.go line 49. And it looked like this was called by line 31. So if we go back to the code, we can see line 31. Okay. And what would we call line 31? The producer. If we go along to the producer and 49, line 49, because we do not have any capacity for our channel. When we say capacity out of the channel, it's zero. So when we try to take a modulus, then we have a divide by zero. So we have to change this a little bit. Well, what we can do is simply say that um, instead of capacity of the channel, we can simply put five here if we like, because um, that's how much we want to deal with. We don't want too many uh, messages, so we can put five. And so let's go back. And so that's the only change we've made. Let's go back and run up. So let's once again clear our screen and run. I notice our program now runs and runs the exact same way. It doesn't deadlock, proving that we have a go routine running our producer and we have a go routine consuming. Okay, so this is nice and dandy, but so what else can we do? We've seen that our use go routines with channels and on buffers channels, which was something that we couldn't do before until we were able to create multiple go routines. So let's look at another example. Now we'll have our producer run for a certain amount of time. So the producer will produce data for a certain amount of time. And of course, when it's finished, it will close the channel. And that would be a signal to the consumer that it should exit. We wouldn't have some artificial number of messages. We'll see how many messages our producers can produce in the time that we will give it. The only place we're going to make a change is in our producer. What we will do is we still need to count our messages. We start off I at one. How long do we do this for? Well, we do it for the current time. So we always check when we hit this for loop, we check is the current time before the end time. Is the current time earlier than our end time? And if that is true, then we should send a message. Okay, so how do we calculate our end time? End time is simply now and add a thousand milliseconds. A thousand millisecond is just a second. Okay, now we could have easily just said one second, but I, I use a thousand milliseconds. And so this is saying from wherever time we hit this function, when we call this function, get the current time set the end time to be a second later. And then so long as the current time is less than when, as we execute, remember time will be marching forward. So long as the current time is not yet a second later than when we calculated end, then keep sending messages. I hopefully that is clear. I don't know how else to say it without sort of mushing it up more. And then of course, once we finish sending messages, then we close because our producer is saying, I'm finished sending messages after one second. There's nothing else to send. I can close this channel. All right, let's go run the code. And there we go. As you can see, our producer was able to produce about a hundred and something thousand messages. And we could run this again and it will vary from your system. And it will vary every time I run it, depending on what my system is doing, how much time I can allocate to run in my code. But you can see it's always sort of over a thousand, um, hundred thousand. And so 
That's how many messages I can send in one second. And this proves that they are running concurrently. If you haven't, if you weren't convinced before, hopefully you are convinced now that we are using an unbuffered channel. There was no way for us to put 130 something thousand messages into a channel because we did not give it any capacity whatsoever. So it must be that is because we're able to produce and consume concurrently. Now let's look at multiple concurrent data producer and a single consumer. And so we'll run more than one producers, which we can see here, we call producer one, producer two, producer three. Since we have multiple producers right into the same channel, we cannot have the producer close the channel because if producer two finishes before producer one and close the channel, then producer one and three wouldn't be able to write into that channel. So what we need is to have a wait group that allows us to make sure that all our producers are finished doing their work before we can close that channel. And that's what we have here. So this takes care of this. But we cannot call a wait group before we start our consumer because if we put this before our consumer, then we will be waiting for our producers, all three of our producers to do work, but it won't be anyone consuming, right? And just remember, this is an unbuffered channel. So we need to start off that consumer. Now we could have started the consumer before we started our producer, no problem. Our consumer would simply be waiting on an, this channel that's open, it's created open until our producers are created. So you can switch the order between these guys when you create the producers and consumers, and you should try that. But certainly the important thing is that we must be able to start those up for us before we go into waiting for the producers to finish. Now, once the producers are finished, we can close that channel. And then the next thing we have to do is just simply wait for the consumer to finish. Now, why do we have to wait for the consumer? Well, remember, the consumer is a go routine. If the consumer is in a go routine, we didn't have to use a wait group for it. But it, without it being a go, go routine, its own go routine, we would never be able to make any progress because if you imagine the consumer was after this wait for producer function, what would happen? Well, we wouldn't be able to make and do any work. And if it, if we put the consumer before, it would simply be block waiting after all the producers have finished sending. And since none of them would have closed the channel, well, our consumer would just be waiting and the producers would have exited and then our program would exit with a deadlock. So again, you can try all these things to experiment and make sure you understand and know how to reason about what's happening. Okay, so that's our main code. So what else do we have to change? Well, we have to add the weight group for our producers and consumers. We need two of them, right? They're different. We need a weight group to work with the producers only and a weight group for let us know when the consumer finish. We can just wait until the consumer is finished consuming all the data before the program ends. Remember, if your program ends, all your go routines are killed. And we don't want to exit our program before the consumer gets to access all the data. Now you can put this consumer at the end without any wait group and it would still appear to work, but that would only be because you have a unbuffered channel. But if you had a buffer channel, well, your program would end immediately and the consumer wouldn't have time to clear that channel. So this is a much better um, way of doing it without that hidden bug. Okay, so the only change we have to make then for our consumer is to say that when you call it, it should immediately increase the number on the consumer weight group. Then it can do the work it was doing before. And then of course, at the end, it should call um, done. For the producers, if you notice how we're running our producers, we don't explicitly see here that we're using go routine because what we said, it's better for us to take care of all that in the function unlike how we're doing it here with a consumer, which we'll fix later. When you call that function, it immediately increments a number on the weight group, and then it launches this go routine. So just wrap all the work I was doing before in a go routine. The weight group that done must be called inside the go routine, can be called outside here because then we'd be immediately decrementing this weight group shortly after we started. And of course, we cannot call close in any of our producers. So that's all there is to it. Let's run this and see what happened. Remember, we have three producers right into the same channel and just one consumer. Now, our previous example where we had one producer right in for a certain amount of time, we were able to send 100 and something thousand messages. How many messages are we going to be able to send now that we have three producers? Let's run it and see. 
and we can see that oh, we are getting messages from our three producers as we can see and they're interleaved in some way but notice we're still sort of capped at about a hundred and something thousand messages over the second or so and it tells us there that it's our consumer that is sort of the bottleneck of our program and so let's fix that so if we look at this example now we have multiple concurrent data producers and consumer this is different than when we had multiple producer and a single consumer now we've added more consumers so we've added just one more consumer but still we have three producers and two consumers and notice we're still using the same channel fortunately for us we already had weight groups set up for our consumer so it was just a matter of simply adding this line of code and changing the consumer id and so what we should be able to see on the output is that our two consumers are telling us that they produce consuming messages from the channel and from these different producers and since the messages just go into the common channel well we don't know who's consuming what well we had to change our consumer a little bit and that's what i said before is that we want to make sure that our consumer takes care of creating the go routine and probably initializing the weight group now let's look at what changes we had to make in our consumer well we had this before so all we did was turn everything that we were doing all the work we just put that in a function literal and then we call the go keyword on this function literal or anonymous function now before we were capped even with three producers running each sending message for one second or a thousand milliseconds we were still capped at hundred something thousand messages so let's see if we can change that now we have two consumers running and for this we decided to take out because we have so many messages what we decided to do in the consumer was to not print out each message so what we're doing a consumer is we receive a message we split it so we use the strings that split function and we split that message at the comma mark and now we have two parts two strings really we have the part that says the producer and the part that says the number and so we don't care about the number part, but we care about that first part, which we put in a map. And so this called DB map, we put that first field in the map and we use that to increment a value on that map object. And by incrementing that int in the map, well, we essentially count how many messages we get from each producer. And we do this inside of each consumer. Hence why our result look like this, that consumer one process you know, so many messages from producer three and so many messages from producer one and so on. That's it for this lecture four. Look at the supplemental video that cover what your exercise is for this section. Let's take a look at your exercise for lecture four. So if we go to our solution directory, for example, and open up exercise four and click on the readme. Let me close this. And you can see that what your task is I was about to say objective but what your task is for this exercise is to write multiple producers running concurrently now in the previous exercise exercise three you wrote multiple producers and consumer running sequentially or in serial fashion well here we're running them concurrently and it's pretty much the exact same exercise most of it is going to be copy code because now you're going to convert that from a sequential program to a concurrent go application and the only addition is that before you had the np program arguments to say how many producers you want to run now you have the nc to say how many consumers and by default by default you will have same thing number maximum number of messages per producer would be 100 unless the user overrides it and number of consumers will be two by default number of producers will be three and i'll show you an example of my program running and you can see that now remember you're using the flag standard package and so it's a great example if you did this previous exercise well you've already done this already and the only thing you have to add is a second a third option program argument which is nc and the difference here now is that unlike the four sec the previous exercise we had to add a big enough channel to all all the messages that's because all our producers needed to run put the messages in the channel and then the consumer here because we're doing it concurrently we actually don't need a channel with any capacity so um 
you'll see um, that you should experiment with using both on buffered and buffered channel to see if that sort of make a difference in how much data and how fast your application runs. Let's see an example of what your output should look like. Just as before, you would want to be able to, in your consumer, extract the message, determine which producer it came from, calculate the sum of the, num the other values from that producer and how many messages. So you're going to count the number of messages from that producer, the sum of all those numbers. You print that out per producer, right? So each consumer print that out per producer. And then, of course, the consumer must print out a total across all those messages. Now, this is where that you will run into some problems because if you, since you, by default, you have two consumers, if they try to start printing out their result, then the result might interleave. So when you see that, definitely go back and look at how you address and resolve critical section, um, code in critical section. So here's an example with your output. Should and start from line 43 here for me. And it should basically says like consumer one process messages from producer two. And I don't care about the order, whether it's producer one or producer two or whatever comes out first. That's not important. What's important is for each consumer to be able to print out the work that it did. So let's take a look at my program running. And so if I run this again, by default, each producer can do a maximum of a hundred messages. I have three producers by default and two consumers. Now I can specify additional. So let's say, for example, I specify M is minus one. One of the requirements is that if you specify an invalid value, then your program should print out a useful help, help message. And this is my help message that says minus M option expects a value that's greater than zero. The default is 100. The minus NC for number of consumer expects a value that's greater than zero. The default is two and so on. And so let's make minus M, let's say 20, oh, 50, uh, minus and uh, NC, let's say three, and we'll leave um, my producers to be a default of three also. And so you can see three consumers and the number of producers were three. And I'll just ignore minus M, just specify this to be, let's go crazy, let's make it seven. And there we go. And oh, I want my number of, oh, yep, let's roll up and see. So this is consumer three, consumer seven, consumer four, consumer two, consumer one. But notice my output is not in to leave. Once a consumer is writing its output, it writes out everything it needs to before the next consumer can write it. And that's the important thing. I don't care about the order in which the consumer actually write the data. All right, so that's it. For your ex in terms of exercise, solution is there if you get stuck. Welcome to section seven, lecture five, channel selection. In this lecture, we'll be looking at a number of ways you can process information from multiple channels. And before we get into looking at the uh, ways in which we can use the select keyword, we'll talk about delay. And so we'll use the time standard package to look at how we can easily insert delays into our application. We'll use the select keyword, as I just mentioned, to choose a channel that is ready for either receiving data from it or for sending data. And we can use the select keyword with multiple channels as you. We'll also see how we can use the default case. And like I said, we're going to tie selecting and using delays to be able to do things like timeout. Let's revisit something we are already doing which is using a single channel to either send data or receive data. But what if you had multiple channels on which you needed to receive data, let's say. Now I'm talking about not having a different Go routine for each channel, which is how we would do it today. But I'm talking about having one Go routine responsible for receiving data from multiple channels. The problem here is that we know that if you try to receive data from ch say channel one and it's not ready, then you couldn't proceed to receiving data from channel two. And so if on the other hand, channel two is ready and you're just waiting on channel one, you'll never get to channel two. So what we want is that if channel two is ready, 
we can go ahead and perceive and receive the data from channel two. And so the select keywords allow us to uniformly pick one of the channel that's ready. So if we have a situation where multiple channels are ready, let's say we had channel one that is ready to receive data and channel three that's ready to send data, the select keyword would say, you know what, let me pick one of these two channels and you can receive from channel one, for example, or send on channel three. And if you're sitting in a loop and these same two channels are ready, ready, whether it's ready for receiving or ready for sending, the select keyword would uniformly pick one of them, which means that over time that you have equal probability among all your, your ready channels. Okay. So we said that if channel one is ready or channel three is ready, you want to be able to uniformly pick from them. And so we can receive from channel one or we can send to channel three. Now let's jump and look at some code. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor, and no surprise, I'm in the directory for Section 7 and Lecture 5. I'm looking at a main.co file. I don't have too much, but to start us on the road of looking at de delays and how you can insert delays in your program, I'll start off by doing it what might seem like the obvious way, but it's sort of the wrong way, and I'll explain why. So let's take a look at some code. You see, I have introduced the uh, FMT package, time package, and my log package. But let's just look at what my main function is doing. It's printing out a message. It says message one at time that now. So we use a time package to call the null function. We then call our function sleep, and we pass it a duration from the time package. So we say one time times that second, and so that means one second, and we want to sleep for one second. We'll look at implementation of our sleep function in a minute. But after we've slept for one minute, one second, sorry, now we can print out the second message, which is message two at time that now. Now, if we've done this correctly, we should see that message two appear one second after message one. Okay, so let's look at the implementation of our sleep function. It's fairly simple. It says delay is time that duration, which we know we're passing in. And so to determine when our function should return, how long we should sleep for, we use this idea of calculating the end time and we sit on a for loop and we set time that now, if it's before our end time, which is already calculated, then we can simply say that oh, we're waiting and essentially doing nothing. Now, we don't have to put this message here. If we're just killing time, well, we can just leave this, um, take this out. But I want to show that oh, we're sitting in this loop for some time. Okay. And so if this is correct, then we should get the effect of delaying or sleeping for one second. Okay, so let's run it. And so that went by pretty quickly. We cannot see the first message and we use log for just waiting. So what I can do then is just redirect all my messages into a temporary file, which I'll call log, for example, that txt could be anything. And then if I do word count minus L on this log file, I can see it. Oh, there's like a hundred and something thousand messages in the file. If I do head on this log file, it gives me the first 10 messages, I believe. And so if I scroll up, you can see that my first message, message one, appeared at nine o'clock, 28 minutes at 27 seconds and you know 508 milliseconds but we'll ignore this last part because if my second message if my func program works correctly i should have slept for one second and my second message should appear at 9 28 28 okay so to determine or that we will do a tail of our log file and so we should see message two appeared at 9, 28, 28, and that's correct. So at least we know that we are sleeping or we have the delay. Now, like I said, we could take note all these messages, but at least we have a way to say that we want to sleep or cause a delay in our application. Let's look at another way which we can do this, get the same effect without us having to write a sleep function. And I've instead used time that sleep. Now we don't need to worry about the implementation of time that sleep, but we could certainly go take a look at it if we want. 
But in this case, and it tells us from the time package that it pauses the current go routine for at least the duration D. Now, what is different about how we did sleep and what it says it's doing, time that sleep is doing? Well, here it's pausing our go routine, which means our go routine isn't actually doing any work, which is good because then that time that we spend waiting, that's one second just sprinting out or sitting in a for loop, that's doing work. Even if we remove this lock line, we're still in this for loop and that's time on the CPU. But since for time to sleep, it puts our go routine to sleep, to wait, to, and it pauses it, not a go routine or not a piece of code on our computer have the opportunity to run. So this is why this is a better way of doing sleep than us using a sleep function that simply just waste CPU cycle. And that's why I call this not the right way to do in sleep. And so this looked essentially like what we had before, except now we call time that sleep. And the result should look the exact same as we see that we get the correct result. First message appear at 9, 20, 32, 10, and we have the second message a second later. So now we know how to sleep. Let's talk about what if we wanted a notification. In other words, think of it like setting an alarm. So far, when we use sleep, we're saying, well, you know, go routine, go pause, and then it's going to wake up. But what if we wanted to get a notification after the time that we're interested in has passed? You could think of it as having someone call you or set an alarm on your phone to say, notify me in one second. And what this means is I'll go off and do something else. And when this alarm goes off, I should be notified of it. And this is slightly different than sleeping. Now, it's not going to be clear that this is what's happening since we only have one go routine. But once we introduce a second go routine, we'll see. We print a message at some time, time that now, and then we call this notify function and it returns something to us. Now, we can see it all. We're trying to read from that something. And that's something happened to be because it's a channel. What we get back is a channel on which we can send time that time, okay, object. And so since our notify object will send us a notification or a message on this channel after the elapsed time, we are free to do some work until this alarm fires, okay? And so our code essentially looked the same as before, except now we're actually getting back a channel on which a message will be sent later. Now, this shouldn't be very surprising to you. This looks exactly like a generator, right? Remember, a generator is this function you call that returns a channel, and on that channel, it sends messages later. Just that for a notification here, we're just going to get one message after, you know, we're, the time has elapsed. So if we look at the implementation of our notifier, well, it takes a duration, a return an out channel of time, time makes the channel, and of course, return that channel. But it kicks off a go routine. So now we have two go routine. We have the one go routine that's running our main and waiting to reach from that channel. But we could have been doing some work and periodically checking, but we don't know that yet. We'll see that much later. And for now, though, since we, we don't know how to really sort of skip if a channel is not ready, well, because remember, we're going to be block waiting for something to come on this channel. This auto go routine will be implementing our sleep. And then after it is slept for the time that we require, it will just simply send the current time on that channel and it closes the channel. Okay. Does that make sense? Now we can get the same effect that we had before, but we'll see how we're moving towards something that allow us to do work and time up. So let's run this code and see what happens. And so the result is exactly the same as before, except this time we use notify. We've written our own notification function that send us a message on a channel. Well, the time package already has a function like this. So we actually don't have to implement it. So let's see the, an example using the time that after function which is similar to our notify after function. And here we go. If we look at how we use the time that after function, it's very similar to how we use our own notify after function. We save the value into an alarm, and then we try to read from the alarm. We could have done the same thing here, but we simply said, try to read from that channel that's returned by time that after. 
we can see that our time.after simply return a channel of a time object. If we run our code, we should expect it to work the exact same. And it does. So we get the same result. So now that we've seen how to sleep and how to get a notification, let's talk about if we have multiple channel on which we wanted to receive a message, how we can prevent being blocked on that channel. And for that, we'll use the select keyword. But before we look at multiple channels, we'll start by simply using one channel. And we'll say, let's have a channel. And notice this channel is nil. I haven't made it. I've simply declared it. So an uninitialized channel is nil. And previously, if we try to receive on a nil channel, our program would crash and say, well, OK, we're deadlocked. But notice, we don't create another Go routine. We simply say, select. And there's a case that tries to read from this channel, channel one, and then we have a default case. Remember I said the select look like the switch keywords. If you can change this to switch, it looks the same, but you use select for channels. And so we're saying, try to receive on this nil channel. And since we can do so, then what happens is we simply execute the default case, which is no data from channel one. So let's run this code. And as you can see, just as expected, no data from channel one because we cannot receive from a nil channel and the select keyword, make sure that we don't block. That's the key thing compared to what we were doing before, you know, executing this case and go to the default case. So let's see what happens if we have multiple channels now, because this is the intent of the select keyword. It allows us to properly handle a channel that is either ready or not ready without blocking. Okay, so now we've moved on and we've introduced two channels. Similarly, we have channel one, channel two, channel of strings, but it doesn't matter. And they're both nil channels. So we try to receive from channel one, try to receive from channel two. And if we receive from channel one, then we say we get data from channel one. If we try, we try to send to channel two. If we can send to channel two, we again say send data to channel two. Now, since both of these channels are nil, we know that we are unable to receive from it. And we know we're going to be unable to send to a nil channel or receive from a nil channel. So the only thing that we can actually do in the select case is to the default case, which is to say we have no communication on channel one or channel two. And so let's run that. And just as we expected, no communication for channel one or channel. So far, you might not be terribly excited, but this opened up the window for us to do some very, very cool things. And I hope to show you by the end of this lecture. So, okay, let's change things a little. So in this example, I want to generate some random bits. So I print out random bit stream, and then I call a function random bits gen, and I give it the integer value 10. So say that, oh, I, this is really saying I want 10 random bits. So if you're not familiar what a bit is, it's simply zero and one. So when we create a bit stream, then we're creating a stream or a set of bits that is, has the value zero and one. So that's my bit stream. What I have returned from this random bit stream function is a channel. And since it's just bit zero one, I decide to use int eight, no reason to use much anything bigger. And so I'll have a channel of int eight bits and I'll simply iterate over that channel of bits and print out the value. And that should give me my bit stream. So now we have an idea how this should look, assuming that I have some values of zeros and one being sent on that channel. Now let's look at random bits generator function. It takes an integer value, returns a channel of int eight. So it makes a channel. It defers closing that channel, meaning that when this function returns is when we want to close the channel which is good because since we're doing a range over this channel as return, we have to close it, make sure the channel is closed, else we'll be blocked. We sit in a for loop. Why a for loop? Because with the select keyword, look at all cases and determine which can be executed, whether you can send or receive from those channels, because the select only do it with channels. And for all the channels that are capable of sending and receiving, it selects from those set of ready channels uniformly. So we have this case in which we can send zero to the channel or we can send one. So since both are capable of sending both of these cases, it will uniformly select one of them. 
it's going to be random. So maybe you might have two or three zeros in a row or two or three ones in a row, something like that, right? It's like flipping a coin. If I flip a coin, I might be able to flip two heads or two tails in series, but over a long period of time, I'll get even equal number of heads and equal number of tails. And of course, once the channel is full, because remember we have a fixed length on the size of the channel, what's gonna happen? Well, we're not gonna be able to send. And so these two cases are not gonna be able to make any progress. And so we go to the default case in which we return. And it's this return that causes the default statement to run, which closes our channel. Okay, so let's run the code. And we get a bit stream and we can run it again. And so we're able to generate these random bit streams with some very, very simple code. And we don't have to use 10. Notice we can use um, essentially any number, even though I wouldn't recommend using very large numbers with this example, simply because we're making a channel of this length. But we can easily handle much larger numbers by our larger bit stream by simply having this be a go routine and it's only send data when the receiver is ready to receive it. And that's much better. In this example, I don't need to change anything in our main. And the reason why is because I, I'm only changing the implementation of a random bit generator. And this time I'm changing it so that, notice it's making a channel, but it's an unbuffered channel. And I'm using a go routine to make sure that I loop over for that number of time. And then once the go routine completes, it just for loop within the go routine, only then I close the channel. So this is the way we would typically write a generator that sends data from a go routine. And this, that's why I said this implementation is better and more scalable than the other implementation we did before. So now I can ask to send 10 bits or a thousand or a million, and this would work much better. So let's run this. And of course, it should work exactly as the same. Of course, we wouldn't get the same result, but we expect that it should work exactly the same. And so let's try running the same example now with, you know, even larger number. So we can say, for example, 10,000. Of course, it's going to be a very long bit stream, but we could run that. And there we go. All right. So this is really, really easy and clever way of generating random numbers. And you don't have to use just zeros and ones. Remember, if you try to send anything, if you add additional cases, because they all will be ready to send in this example, then it will pick uniformly from those different cases. And if you want more ones than zero, well, then you can simply put cases for more ones. We'll see that in a bit. So let's continue. So I'm using the same random bit generator that is using a go routine, but instead in my main, what I've decided to do now is send a larger number of bits, 10,000, as I did in the previous example. But this time I want to ensure or validate that I am getting about equal number of ones and equal number of zero. So this is the total number of bits I'm gonna send. And what I do is make a map M that is going to map the value I get from my random number generator and count how many of those. If I get zero, I count how many zero. If I get one, I count how many ones. What I need to print out is the result of my calculation. And so I convert the value from V, I loop over the map, I convert, convert that to a float, and then I calculate the total and I calculate the percentage and I print it out. So let's run this and see. And as you can see, zero occur about 50%, 50.22 time percent of the time and one occur of 49%. So for all intents and purpose, this is equal time. And of course we expect it to be a little bit off, but notice how um, it flips, but, or changes from time to time. But at least we have confidence that we're getting zero about half the time. I said earlier that you can sort of skew the result if you want, because remember, select statement is doing uniform distribution of the cases that are ready. So if I wanted to have about 66% of the 
of my result be one, I can simply do this because if you look, you'll see one third of the time it will pick zero and essentially two thirds of the time it will pick one. And so if we run our code again, we should see 30% for zero and one occurring about 66% of the time. And that's exactly what we see. Um, we can introduce other numbers, like I said before. Um, so let's say, for example, we decide to add two to the mix. Now we should see that one occur 50% of the time because we have zero is going to occur one out of four, two is going to occur one out of four time one a quarter of the time. And then because we have two opportunities to send zero, um, to send one is going to occur 50% of the time because we have four possible cases. And again, we run our program and that's exactly what we see. Final example is to combine the fact that we know to do delays, we know how to select from different channels and to say, can we do timeouts? And that means that, oh, can we say that if we're going to wait too long for data to either come on a channel or for us to be able to send on a channel, we'll just simply give up. And the answer is yes, we can do it very, very easily. Let's look at what we did in our main program. In our main, we simply and we simply add a producer function, which we know is a generator because it re returns a channel on which it will send some messages. We have a consumer that takes that channel and does consume the data from that channel. Okay, so let's look at our producer. Producer, again, very easy, simple, makes a channel, returns it, kicks off a go routine that would send, in this case, just 10 messages on that channel. But notice, we purposely do not close our channel. That's because we can think of this producer as intending to send some messages later. If we look at our consumer, a consumer sits in this for loop and it tries to read a message from the channel. So if it can read a message, it reads the message and it prints it out. If it cannot read a message, what it tries to do is try to read a message from a channel that's returned by time that after. The best way to do this is to say that we create a channel at the top of our loop before when we go into this for loop we're going to say try and select a message from this channel and i have already created how long i wanted to wait for this message and then now i'll try and read a message from this channel on and see if the channel is ready before i remember i'll always get a message from my alarm after one millisecond so this is going to be ready to read and what we want to make sure is that we can read from this in channel before our alarm is ready because if that's the case what's going to happen is if both are ready at the same time then we'll be uniformly selecting between the two okay but that's fine it just means that at some point because our channel is ready we got a message from our alarm we'll eventually pick it and we'll return so we want to set that alarm here. So let's run our code and see. And we can see we got our messages from our producer and then eventually the timeout occur. That occurred because while our producer was able to, while we were able to receive a message from our producer, well, we ignore the channel. And then we went around, created another alarm each time we went around the loop. We sort of give each message up with 10, one millisecond. Now there's some things to be careful here about. Make sure, and we talk about this when we introduce Go Routine. If we don't give enough time, even though we launch our Go Routine here, call our consumer, if we come into this and do not give enough time for our Go Routine that's producing messages to actually start sending messages, then we might say that, oh, oh we didn't get message in time, but it's not so much that our go producer failed to send a message is that it probably never got to run and this could happen if our timeout here is too short so let's say for example we made this one tenth of a millisecond let's see if we're going to still be able to get any messages and you see we basically did not wait long enough for our go routine or producer go routine to send some messages now you might get different results with one tenth of a millisecond, you might still be able to get messages depending on your processor, your computer on how many cores and how fast and so on. 
maybe one millisecond you might not be able to see any messages so if that's the case make sure that all you increase it so if one millisecond is not working for you try two millisecond or ten milliseconds to make sure that all you're giving your the go routine producer long enough time to actually you know produce some data now we can see this another way we can put in our producer like i said let's say it intend to send some messages after so it send messages in bursts okay so our producers basically this is simulating if our producer is sort of bursty send some data then it has to wait to maybe get some data out of the wire before it could send more data and so in our consumer we might say well you know what if we have to wait more than two milliseconds for data then we want to return and let's make sure this works by waiting only one millisecond. Well, actually, let's wait four milliseconds. So we allow our producer to pause for three milliseconds, but then must send some data. So this should work. This should allow us to get 20 messages, right? Because we're waiting four milliseconds. But notice, since we're waiting four milliseconds, the producer is going to just pause for three. So this should work fine. So we should see all 20 of our messages eventually. Uh, well, something is wrong now. Ah, our consumer is reading um, essentially empty string. Why is this? Because we've closed our channel, and since our channel is closed, we can still read from it. Remember, you can read the empty string from a closed channel. So, since we can always read from this channel, our alarm will never fire so we still need to say that you know what um we are going to probably make it so that we don't close the channel and and there are, there are 20 messages because we're actually blocked in our select statement here trying to read now you might say well what happens if we can read from a channel that's uh, closed? Well, as we know, that's null. So we need to read, use this to, to read from that channel. Okay. So in that case, this will allow us to say, well, we completed reading from that channel. And so, of course, we have to close the channel here. So this is slightly different than timing out. Uh, we just know in this case that the producer intends not to send any more data. In this case, we set a timeout when it takes too long to send data. So let's, we should still get our 20 messages and then we should send no more data from channel in. And that's great. Uh, we'll use print line instead. And there we go. No more data from channel in. We receive our 20 messages. Now, let's just say we do not want to wait four milliseconds, but we only willing to wait two milliseconds. Now we should see that we only process 10 messages because we gave up after waiting two milliseconds and our producer wants to wait three milliseconds between pauses. Make sense? So always make sure that what you're doing with your timeout accurately reflect how your producer is going to send message. Make sure your producer have time to start up because if we make it too short, then your producer doesn't even have time to start sending message. And that happened when we, in my case, when I use this, okay? I don't even see any messages from my producer because it, that go routine didn't have time to even kick off. So, so that's the gist of timeout and selection. What we see is that we can combine the select keyword, which allow us to monitor multiple channels regardless of if those channels are trying to send or receive, and also combine the fact that we can get a timeout 
from the time that after package, for example, that sends a time on a channel and using that same channel with the select keyword, now we can simulate the ability of how long we want to wait to send something or even how often we want to send something. We can use the same thing to say that we can introduce pauses in how we send our messages. Check out the supplemental material for your exercise for this lecture. Take care. Have a great rest of the day. If we click on the exercise five directory and look at the readme, it says, write a complete Go application to generate unique passwords. That is your to do. Now, what are the requirements? So if you're using a Western keyboard, then you're going to use the letters A through Z, lowercase, and A through Z, uppercase, including the numbers zero through nine, and then these special characters as part of a generated password. Now, if you in another um, part of the world where the set of characters or your keyboard most likely are not the Western set of characters, then of course, you will have to select from that. Regardless of the character set that you have available to you, one of your requirements is that the minimum length for a password is eight characters. The default is 16. So without typing anything else, you should be able to run your application and get a password that is 16 characters in length. And they can use the minus L option to specify that they want a longer password. But if they specify anything less than eight characters, then you should give them a warning. Now for this, just as in the previous exercise, you use the standard flag package. And the reason for that is because we've already seen that though you can parse os.args to get the argument, but that sort of distract from the problem we're trying to solve. It's okay to do that earlier because we're trying to understand how um, to use things like string conversion and understand the language and see what's available. But as we move on, we don't want to be burdened down with these things that sort of distract us from what we're trying to solve. And I decided to go ahead and have you use the flag package now, even though there's something there in using the flag package that we haven't covered yet, but just accept that on faith. Look at the examples that I show you, and it should be pretty straightforward how to adapt it and use it in your exercise, even though we haven't covered exactly what is going on. Okay, so I strongly recommend using the flag package. It's not that hard. Um, the other thing is that you must use the select statement to determine when you pick one of these characters. Think about what we just covered in the lecture where we were able to select whether we're going to send a zero or a one is the same sort of concept we're going to use here to generate random numbers. The other thing you want to do is in creating passwords, you want to have more letters than you have numbers, more numbers than you have special characters. I'll show you what it looks like when I run my solution for, for this problem. And as you can see, I have a password. It's 16 characters. I mean, we could sit here and count it. I have so far just it looked like two numbers, zero and one. And in terms of special character, I have also two special characters. But if we keep running this, we will see oh, for the most cases that I usually come up with more numbers than special characters. Of course, it's possible that you can come up with more, you know, with equal number of numbers and characters, but just know that oh, when in the code, if you were to look at it, you'll see why it's skewed that way. And I've shown you already how to make it such that you can get more zeros or more ones already. We cover that um, by simply adding more cases for those. Okay. <laughs> this is the same trick I use here. Um, in this example, yes, you could see I have two numbers and then just one special character. And I can keep running this and uh, you'll sort of see the same thing occur over and over and over. In this case, I didn't have any special character. Well, just happened that way. All right. And like I said, I can specify minus L. And let's say I choose to have a character of character length one. And it tells me, no, you can't do less than eight. And the default is 16. And so then I can specify eight. And I should be able to get a character of eight. Uh, password of eight character and of course I can do 25 for example and get a much longer character okay so that's it fairly simple example I think 
but it still sort of illustrates some of these problems that if you try to solve it with another programming language, it's a little bit more involved, but Go makes it very, very easy to write these sort of utilities. And this is a real application that you can use to help you generate password and then save your password in some master password application or something. Finally, before we close, let's look at what your reading assignment is so that you can get more information on the select keyword that we used in this lecture. So here are the reading assignments. You already had this link to details about the channel type in the Golang language specification. And now the only thing to add to that is the documentation or the section of the Golang specification that talks about the select keyword. And it's really good to sort of read this and get the perspective of the language designer on how these features should be used. So hopefully if you haven't been reading it, you will read it. Welcome to lecture six, section seven. In this lecture, we'll be talking about concurrency patterns. When we talk about concurrency patterns, we were talking about a few things that we've already been using, but we haven't really been giving them names. Let's look at the topics we'll be covering. I'm only gonna stick to simple patterns. So we will look at generators, sync, what I call processors, and I'll explain why I call them processors, fan out pattern, in pattern. Before we get into looking at code or even talking about the patterns, let's understand what a design pattern is. So before I said we were going to be looking at some simple patterns. What I should have said are some simple software design patterns. They are patterns all over in every field and discipline, but we're restricting our discussion to software design patterns. So I figured let's start with a definition and go from there. So I grabbed this definition from Wikipedia. And let's go through it. It says, a design pattern is a description or template for how to solve a problem that can be used in many different situations. So once you have a design pattern, or if you have several problems, the solution to those problems might look a certain way. And then you say, oh, I have a pattern for how to solve these type of problems. And like I said, in this lecture, we're going to be given names to things that we've already been doing. You will see that oh, we've used these design patterns many times in many different situations to solve many different types of problems. And they just sort of come up over and over and over again. It continues that a design pattern or design patterns are formalized best practices. So after many software developers sort of solve the same type of problem and come up with a similar type of solution, they formalize and say, hey, we can use this as a pattern for solving these type of problems. And one of the things that help you out as a software engineer is if you know these patterns, then it helps you solve certain types of problems pretty quickly because you already have an idea of how other people solve it. All right. So let's go again. Design patterns are formalized best practices that the programmer can use to solve common problem problems when designing an application or a system. Okay, so that's all we sort of need to know is that a pattern is something that many experienced software developers will recognize. And we're gonna restrict ourselves to just dealing about with six patterns, okay? And the ones that we're going to talk about are specifically concurrency patterns. There are other types of patterns that fall into the realm of object-oriented programming. And so we're not really talking about those. Before we get into talking about patterns, though, I'd like to introduce you to the Golang mascot. If you haven't seen him before, it's a gopher, well, a simplified drawing of a gopher. That's the mascot for the Go programming language. And I'll use a gopher to represent a Go routine. Remember, a Go routine is this thing that manages the execution of a function. And so it sort of runs off by itself. So if we can imagine that we have a program and each of our Go routine is a gopher, that gopher is off doing work independently, right? Okay. So let's start with our first pattern. Our first pattern is called a generator. So what is a generator? We've seen generators before. I'll use the gopher mascot with a speaker to represent a go routine that produces data on a channel. So when I say a generator, I want you to have in mind 
this gopher that can be doing some work independently and what it does is generate data on a channel that it returns. So for our first example then, to look at what a generator is, we will represent it like this. We'll say that this little oval thing with a notch at the bottom, and I little put a little circle on top to say that it sort of runs by itself and you know, it just could keep going. Let's just jump to our Visual Studio Code Editor and look at creating and using generators. Here I am in Visual Studio Code, Section 7, Lecture 6. And we have a few examples to go through. But let's close the Explorer here, give us some room to work with. In terms of the code I've already written, you've seen this before, right? I have a random number generator set up, and that's it. Let's put some code and examine what it's doing. So the new code I've added simply creates a channel called done. And from the name of the channel, you can imagine it's being used to signal that go routine should clean up. I then call a function int gen, passing it the go the done channel, sorry, got passing it the done channel. And so this will be used to tell this in generator when it should stop producing data. All I'm doing is from that channel, I loop around and read 10 values and print them up. After I've read 10 values, I then send true. It wouldn't matter if I send true or false on this channel, but I send true on the done channel and that tells the generator that it should stop generating data. So now let's look at the implementation of my ingen function. So we make a channel call out. This is channel of int and we return it. But before returning, we launch a go routine. So if you call this function, you are not blocked because it makes a channel returns, but it launches a go routine to do some work on that channel that it makes, on this out channel. And what does a go routine do? It sits in a for loop, so forever. It sits there, try to send a number on out or try to receive a value on done. If I can receive a value undone, then what? I close the channel that I created, which means whoever is reading from this channel will know that oh, I do not intend to send any more data. And then I simply return. I must return because I am in a for loop. If I do not return, what would happen is I'll close the channel, I'll go back around, try to send. I cannot send because the channel is closed. I'll try to receive, but unless somebody else is planning to send me another done, I will not execute this case and I'll be blocked. And even if I get another close, I'll try to close the channel a second time and that's going to be a problem. My program would crash. So I need to return to get out of this for a loop. So let's run the code and see. And as you can see, I have some numbers. How many numbers I said I was going to print? 10. So there goes 5. This another 5. And then I said after my main program says, loop around, get 10 numbers, and then after you've printed 10, then send done to that go routine. Now, once I send done, I do not wait around to see if this go routine needs some time to clean up. None of that. I just sort of exited immediately. Now, we'll talk about that later. You can imagine that my generator probably, when it had to clean up, when I send done, maybe it had to do a lot of work and not just closing out the channel, but maybe it had to close some files, some database connection, who knows what, maybe a lot of work. And so essentially this is a little bit of cruel because I said done and then I immediately exit the program. Our next concurrency pattern is a sync. Now I'll call a sync something where you send data and it consumes it. So we've seen this before. We've been calling this a consumer before, right? We think of it as just a function that is just sort of take data and just do something with it, but it doesn't really produce any, you know, data of its own on, let's say, a channel, for example. It might produce output, it might write to a file, but you can imagine that how the data terminates there. So there are a number of words you can use. You can call it a terminator, you can call it a sync, you can call it a consumer. But again, once you have the general idea, even if I use slightly different words than somebody else might use, once you have the general idea of the pattern, well, you sort of can't escape how it's used. 
So here I'll represent a sink as a gopher that's sort of listening for data or information to come, but it sort of consumes it, right? It works on it, blah, 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 but it doesn't pass it on to another gopher, for example. So we'll say a sink is a function that launches a go routine to consume data that is sent on a channel. That's how we'll think of a sink. You know, let's think of some examples that um, we can write. We can imagine that there's data being produced on some channel. We don't care who created the channel. All we need to know is that we're going to consume that data. So we can have like a counter, for example, as a go routine that will consume data from that channel. And so all we need to know is that we can read data from that channel. From the point of view of this, for us, we'll keep in mind that data in our representation are going to be, is going to be flowing from left to right. So it comes in from the left and goes towards the right. So let's jump to our Visual Studio code and look at some code examples. Let's look at our main. Our main, we're going to count numbers. This is our sync. It's called counter. We give it the channel that we want it to consume data from. And we expect it to consume that data and somehow do something with it, maybe print out some report or something. Now, how long should our program run? If we decide to sleep, in the main go routine, let's call it go routine one. This is go routine two, and the go routine created his go routine three. If we decide to sleep or pause go routine one, we still our application still has two go routine running, so that shouldn't give us any deadlock or anything. We should be fine. And then after a second of sleeping, we will send a done message on that channel to tell the generator it should stop. So our generator really is going to be free to generate as much data as it can to our sync in a second. The only thing that's really new here is our sync. Our sync simply takes this channel, it's called in, and it creates a go routine that says, I'll start doing some work on this channel with the data from this channel, and it gets the current time. That's the time when it's going to start doing work. And it sits in a loop and it ranges over the data that's coming in that channel. It doesn't know how much data, so it uses a range operator to try and consume all the data that's available. And then when it can't consume any more data, when the channel is closed, for example, it just simply print out how many items or numbers it consumed from our channel and how long it took. That's all. So let's run our program. And there we go. Well, Something is wrong. What is happening here? We see our counter or sync starts to start up, but we don't see any result. And the reason why we don't see any result is because of what I hinted at when I said that we send done. We send done to our generator and then immediately our main program exit. It did not wait for our generator to complete its work if there was more work to do it did not wait for our counter the sync to say well okay i've consumed all the data that's in that channel and i need to print out my result my summary so that is what i entered at before when we use something like this we need to be able to not only tell our generator to shut down but we also need to make sure that we wait long enough for our generator to finish with do what it's doing in the cleanup and also for or sync. And this is going to go for all Go routines. We need to make sure our Go, we wait long enough for our Go routine to end. And we covered this already. When we talk about Go routine, we talk about how to wait for Go routine. This was in section six. So we will just put those things to work now because we've done it already. Let's look at how we can fix the problem from our pre previous example. So let's see how our main function has changed now. We still have pretty much the same code, except after we signal that we want the generator to exit gracefully, we wait to make sure that the generator has completed its work properly and the counter is finished its work. How do we ensure that? Well, we simply make the generator and the counter also use the wait group. And that is easy to do. Let's start with the generator. For the generator, we simply ensure that once we first call that function, the first thing it does 
So we add one to our weight group and we do everything else we're doing. But because I do not want to worry about how my go routine will exit and what I should call um, weight group that done here or below here, I simply put it at the beginning of my go routine to say defer weight group that done. And we learned that defer means that when this function is about to exit, which means when this go routine it will terminate, the go routine will terminate when it can no longer run this function or when this function returns. So just before that, that is when we want to say that oh, we are done in this go routine. In terms of our counter, we did the exact same thing too. We added weight group that add as the first statement when you call the counter. And then we ensure that in the function that is being run by the go routine, that we defer weight group that done to be the last thing that gets executed before the function ends. So that means that once our generator terminates, well, it's going to terminate, but we still might have work to do. We have to consume some data and, of course, print out our result. But before this function ends, our default statement will execute weight group that done. So it's just as if we had weight group that done after this printf statement. And now let's run our code. And we can see that our single routine said it was doing some work. And then at the end of it, it printed that it ran for about a second and it counted 2 million um, items. So this is a much better implementation of our using generator and sync where we get the correct result. Let's move on to our next concurrency pattern. So our next concurrency pattern is looking at something I will call a processor. I will see in a minute why I choose to call it a processor. Other people might call it different things, but I like the word processor because of how it operates. So let's start with this gopher. What if this gopher was also receiving data from some channel that already existed, but it received data, did something to it, and then it sort of passes it on. Key thing here is that data comes in and data goes out. So this gopher has a very particular way of operating. It always accepts a channel on which it can read data, and then it also returns a channel on which it produces data. And this type of concurrency pattern I call a processor, because to me, it seems that what it's doing is the most generic thing, which is just process data, take data in, do some work on it, and produces more data. So we'll call a processor a function that launches a Go routine to both consume and produce data. Let's take a look at what our example might look like. So imagine that we have, in our case, an in generator, and it's generating data on this channel. And then we had a Go routine that is our processor, and this Go routine is a filter, and it would only filter or allow to pass through even numbers. If the number is odd, it drops it. And it, of course, creates in channel, and that now can then be fed to our counter or our sink. But with this simple pattern, you can solve any number of problems. Or you only want to let you numbers greater than 1,000 or less than 10,000 or between 1,000 and 105, right? So this is where this thing can be used over and over again. What if you're searching a large data set for something? You're searching a large data set for everyone who live in a certain region of the country or in a certain city. Same thing, you can have your generator just pick up data from the network, from a database, from files or whatever, feed it through your processor, and your processor is just looking for that particular thing and then if it finds it, it passes through to something else that either raises an alarm, conks it, you know, prints it, all these other things. Again, you see the idea that once you have the pattern, you can apply a number of different problems whose solution fit that pattern. So let's jump to our code and take a look. We are in our main program and we're looking at a processor. In this case, the processor we're looking at is going to do filtering to filter you know, out the even number. Well, when I say filter out, I mean for all the numbers that's coming in, just keep the even numbers, right? Don't don't get rid of them. Um, so um, I said filter out because I'm looking at the set of numbers and saying, just take out the even numbers. And again, we have this before that doesn't change. We have our generator. And all we've done is change over to using this function we call a filter. What does our function filter do? It takes as input, it has two inputs. One 
is the channel where the data is coming in and we could have put inside of our filter the ability to just filter out the function like we could have implemented this logic inside of our filter we could have called it filter even or something like this and just hide this detail but i wanted to make a more generic filter that you can sort of modify, modify by passing a predicate so if you don't know um, too much about computer science programming it's just a function that modify how the filter would work so in this case i'm passing a anonymous function or a function literal that takes an integer value which is what we will pull off of this channel and returns a boolean so this allow our filter to ask this predicate should i keep this value or not i'll give you a value to test and should i keep it everything else remains the same in terms of we now have our filter returning yet another channel of int which should only be in this example even numbers only and that passes it to our counter now let's take a look at what our filter is doing it makes an output channel which is what we said a processor does now we check and see if we have a predicate function if we don't have one well we just write a simple one that regardless of what value it's given it's just simply returned to true which means that oh if we don't give a predicate function it just allows things to pass through unmodified so how is that used well we range over the input and then we call our predicate function and we give it the value that we got from our input if that predicate function returns true then we send that value on if you remember from our previous example we we're able to do about two million numbers period those are even and odd numbers we have to imagine so let's run our code and see what we get and for a second and notice our counter run for a second this time too but now it only looks like we're getting like around you know six hundred thousand okay um so that's fine but at least we think this is working but to be sure what we really want to see is what happened if we counted how many numbers were generated then we so we want a counter that's sort of a processor itself that just simply count the number but pass them through unmodified then we could pass that to our filter then we can pass them to this counter so we have two different counts let's think about something i'll call a daisy chain or a pipeline and you might often hear people use pipeline or daisy chain again depending um, what field you're in and what kind of problem they're talking about but what it really is is nothing more than everything that we've seen so far which is imagine i had a generator and then i pass it to a processor and now i can chain a number of processors together to sort of have different things happen so my first processor there could take this information and count it the next one would sum it the other would create an R, calculate an average and the other can print it and then at the end of the chain or the pipeline i can have a sync that just you know store the end result or but whatever it does it terminates that whole um chain of message or data right and if we add some labels to our gopher here you can see we have six gophers but really a gopher or gopher a is just a generator gopher f is a sync and go for b c d and e they're just generators which we have already seen but all we've done now is put them together into this daisy chain or pipeline all right and so that's the thing we're going to use to be able to determine how many numbers we generated and we will do this by using a processor we'll call a pass through counter why because we don't want to modify the numbers that come out of our generator we just simply want to count how many numbers that we're seeing and that will produce a channel on which it would send copy those numbers to that it gets on the input then we will use a filter and our filter will filter out the even numbers as before and then we will count it so here we are in our code and the only thing that changed from our previous example is that now we've inserted this pass through counter between our generator and filter so now we have to look at our pass-through counter our pass-through counter 
operates just like the other counter, but now since it's a processor, it needs to return a channel. So let's run the code. And so we could see our two counters started, and our pass through counter said in the one second it's been running, it saw 600 and something numbers. That's how many numbers it saw. Our counter, which comes after the filter, saw 300 and something even numbers, so about half. So we can see that even though we are sort of using the same generator, but because we're doing a little bit more work, the amount of numbers that we can generate sort of significantly went down. And it could be that my computer is busy also, but this at least gives us confidence that oh, we are filtering out numbers compared to how many we generate. So our fifth concurrency pattern is what we'll call fan out. And for people who have a background in like electrical engineering or electronics, you're going to see this as really being like a demultiplexer. But let's start with a generator looking gopher. Imagine I had a go routine that generated data, but we know that our, our gopher can get data also. So now this looks like a processor because it's receiving data and generating data. With the fan out, what's different is that instead of generating data on one channel, it generates data on multiple channels. And that's why I said this looks like a demultiplexer if you're a person with background in electronics, because we're receiving data on one channel and then we're spreading it out and putting it on multiple channels. Now with this pattern, you can imagine that we're receiving data from a file and maybe we want to do a copy of it on multiple channels so that one consumer see so multiple consumers see the same data but they operate it on it differently or they do different things okay that would be an example where you might want to copy the data but maybe you might want to be able to distribute the data for load let's say you're receiving a lot of data and you have multiple locations to send them so that they can process it in parallel to uh, allow you to process data faster you can imagine that you take every other one and send it to the different places. It's almost like dealing cards, for example, right? Let's look at how we can use this in our example. So what if we have a generator and then we'll call this function fan out, okay? And we'll fan out in tree, in which case our fan out go routine or function will create three channels. It will return three channels on which we can then assign to give to different consumers. In this case, the consumer we're giving it to our sink are just counters. So in our main routine, we still have our generator, but this time we just call it numbers. Our fan out takes these numbers and produce three, um, call them stream one, two, one and two for now, um, not too descriptive, but notice how we create sinks to process the data from those different streams. So the only thing we can look at now is our fan out. Straightforward, takes a channel, return three channels. We do the same thing, we make sure that how we say when we're done, and so we defer that. But notice how we implement our for loop here. We range over the input, and then we use select. Why select? Because select says, look, we got a value from our input, and we need to send it to one of these outputs. So let's send it to one of them that's ready to accept. So that's all that our fan out is doing. So let's run the code and see. And for about a second of work, what happened? Well, we were able to send about the same number to each one of our conquer. So this is our final concurrency pattern. And this one is called fan in. As you can imagine, it looks like just fan out flipped around. In other words, we can have multiple input channels on which we have a go routine or a gopher reading data, and then it just produces it on one channel. So you can think of it as just sort of collapsing data. Now, you can really just think of the left side as M number of inputs and the right side as N number of outputs. So even though we've been dealing with like two to one or, you know, one to three or something like that, 
it really doesn't have to be. We can imagine that we have data coming in from, let's say, 10 different offices, location, 10 different files at the same time. Go to a go for and go routine where it gets multiplexed onto maybe two other channels. So how can we use this then in our example? Let's say we have our generator and it's generating integer numbers. We can have another generator that generating alpha, which are just letters, right? To A through Z, for example, in the Western alphabet. And then we can send that to fan in, which in this case is fan in two. And in this case, we'll keep it simple and say that the output is one. But again, it could be any number um, of outputs. And so we send that to something that just simply print the combined result. So in our code, we have the fan in example. And the way we did that is we still use and done, but we have two generators. We have an integer generator and an alpha generator. And so since we need to signal both of them to complete or to clean up and close, stop generating data, well, we have to send two values on our channel. One of them is going to get it, then the other one. We don't care which one. We just know that two of them are listening to this channel. So if we send two values, then each should get it. And so what is new? Our printer, fairly easy. Channel of strings, just loop around, print all the numbers. When you've exhausted everything, then print a new line and then say you're done. We want to make sure that our main waits until everybody's finished doing what they're supposed to do. Fan in, again, fairly simple, almost like fan out, except now we try to select a value from either one of the two channels that we're going to be reading from. So n is a value from our numbers channel. We convert that to a string by using the FMT printf passage. There are a number of ways you can do it, but this is one of the simplest ways. That turns it into a string and sends it to the out channel. And here, when we get a letter, we just simply cast it to a string and send it out. If we cannot send, we should close our output channel. And this is our alpha generator. It just look exactly like our int generator, except since we were generating alphas, what I do, I take a string of alpha, the characters I want, I cast it to a slice of rune, and then I try to send. What do I send? Well, I need to send a rune because I have a slice. So this is what letters is. And I index into it with a random number just to make sure that I'm not out of bounds. I take the length and I use that. Now, instead of calculating the length every time, I can just calculate the length once. There we go. And that should be better. All right. So let's run our code. And so we can see that all we have letters mixed in with numbers, letters mixed in with numbers. Sometimes we're able to get as two numbers, sometimes two letters, but it doesn't really matter. All we know is that we have letters and numbers mixed in, and that comes from two different streams. There is fan in. Very, very simple and straightforward. Can do more complicated things, but the important thing is just the pattern. Once you see the pattern, a lot of problems could just fall. So the solutions to a lot of problems can be solved or can be shown to fit into that pattern. Okay. All right. So that's it. In the next lecture, we will wrap up this section and then close out with our labs. So there are no exercises for this lecture. Do take a look at the supplemental material for this section. Take care. See you in the next video. Bye. Okay. So let's go over the labs for this section. Now, what's different about these labs is one, they're actually a rework of the word count avocation that we did in section six for lab one and two. And a little bit more on that in a minute. But the other thing that's different is that really I give you the solution to these and I don't actually want you to try them unless you have a clear idea of what is it that you can do to improve. I'll explain why this is so. So for this section, you sort of don't really have a labs, even though I'm covering labs. And let me explain why. The labs for this section is a rework of the word count application that we did in section six. If you remember the word count application was to write a Go program that will count the number of occurrences of each word. And the word, the data that you'll be getting this, these words from was just one or more text files that we provided to you on the command line of your application. And so you'd use OS.R to get those values. Okay. 
what we did in section six was we said, well, a program like that can have a workflow like this, or the program flow could be like this. Data is this abstraction, and it doesn't really matter if it's a file system, a network, or whatever, or multiple files in our case, but we have a piece of code that's responsible for reading in the data and just presenting lines of text. Then we have another piece of code that will then take those lines of text and split them into words. Then we have another piece of code that takes words and count them and update some sort of thing that says, okay, I'll count each word. And then at the end of the program, it would write the output. We also said that, oh, in this sort of design, you can have an iterative design that just sort of sits there and read input, read a line from, you know, the data source, split it, pass the words on to the word counter, which would do the updating and keep track of how many words, and then keep doing this until you've exhausted your input. And then at the end, you'd write the result. And so we did that, or we did this implementation of this iterative design in section six, lab one. Then we timed it and we compared it to a concurrent design in which we said, well, in a concurrent design, you can make all these little pieces, concurrent pieces of code. I put a little loopy thing in there, meaning that in, assess in essence, if you use channels, you can just pass the data along. But of course, we didn't really know channels then, so all we said was, how can we make this concurrent? And this is one way in which you can do it concurrently. And assuming that you have multiple cores, well, this could be done parallelly, right? Each one of these little thing, pieces of the code could be reading lines in parallel as it's splitting and counting. But what we end up implementing was something slightly different. But if we keep going with this idea of different concurrent design, this is one in which you just made each of these pieces of code concurrent and you connect them with channel now that we know channels. Or you can say, well, if I can do that, then I can examine my code, profile it, and see where I can improve performance. If it's spending a lot of time splitting lines, then I could have multiple line splitters, okay? And then again, if I have multiple enough cores, these things could be running in parallel. The reader could be running in parallel to the multiple line splitters could be running in parallel with your word count. Of course, these are all design decisions you, you should make after you've profiled a simple design. So let me stop here for a second and give you my recommendation. I strongly suggest that when you go to implement a solution, you have a general idea, like in our case, the general flow of the application, the program flow, and then you implement the simplest piece of code to get this working. Then if it doesn't have the performance characteristics that you like, you should profile it first to see where it's spending time, and only then you can know and you'll be justified in where you're making improvement and changes or why you're making those changes. So since we're not gonna be able to profile design, to see where it's really slower, because when we did the concurrent one, I expected that in your example, and as in the case of mine, that the concurrent version was actually slower than the iterative one. And you'd have to profile it to know why it's slower, but I can give you an idea why it's slower, and I'll cover that in just a minute. But without the ability to profile, we'll just be guessing on where to improve things. So let's continue with possible concurrent designs um, we can use. Another thing we could do is say, you know what, um, maybe line splitting does take a long time, but also if we try to send all the words to one Go routine that's doing the word content, that's also um, a performance bottleneck. And so we maybe we might decide to split those up too. And so notice we're using all the concepts that we've learned in this chapter. We've learned about fan out, and you can see that there in terms of when we the reader is just creating multiple streams on which we can have you know different line splitter. And yet another design would be to implement multiple occurrences of our current current readers and so on. So we could sit over a loop and say, well, let's create two readers or three readers or a reader for each file of our input, for example, and have that send the lines on a channel that's unique for a splitter and so on. So we could have multiple of these lines that you see instead of two, we could have three or four. And if we have enough cores again, these things can be running in parallel. Once you see how we can make things concurrent, we've shown that how you can just duplicate the pieces that are concurrent. So if you have a generator and it's concurrent, well, you could just copy and paste it and you have another generator, right? If you implement it correctly. Now, these are just some possible concurrent um, implementation, not all possible way in which you can structure your code. 
But let's go back to what we implemented in Section 6, Lab 2. We had a reader that was sitting there and looping over the files. And then for each line, it would sort of create a splitter that would then write to the same word counter. And it's because we were writing to the one word counter and it was being called from multiple threads. Notice our word counter wasn't concurrent. Our word counter was a function being called by the multiple splitters. And because of that, we had a map that was keeping track of which words and how many times they occur. We had to introduce a mutex to control how and which go routine had access to that shared map. And it is this piece of code that if I had to guess without profiling, remember we don't, we haven't covered profiling yet, so we can't really do profiling, but that would be the way to do it is profile a code to see which part, why is it slower? Then the iterative version and then know exactly what to fix. But if I had to make an educated guess, then I would say it's the fact that we had to lock and unlock the mutex for each and every word that we wanted to write into the map. So this is why you do not really have a lab that I want you to try and do unless you want to just stretch yourself by manipulating the code to try some of these different examples and see if it's better. But without being able to profile the code, you'd be just guessing on what to change. And so that's why I cannot ask you to do a lab because it would be a guess. But I still wanted to implement a few possible solutions and present it to you. So let's go take a look. So before we can see if the new implementations are actually better than the old one, we should go back and run the old one and see how much time it took to process data. So we go back to section six and we'll start with lab zero one. This is the iterative solution and we'll run it on the one input file. As you can see, it took 200 and something milliseconds, but let's run it on all of the files in that directory. And again, this is iterative. So it's going through each file and it took 3.8 seconds to process the fastest so far to process all the files is about 3 point something seconds. Okay, so let's now try our concurrent solution or first step at a concurrent solution. And let's again run it on Sherlock Holmes one file. Remember this took about 200 and something milliseconds. Oh, so that's about the same. And let's do on all 15 files, see if our concurrent solution, notice we created concurrent readers. So we had 15 files and we read sort of all of them in um, thing and notice this is actually slower. So we could run this again. So even though we're able to create go routines that try to read the files concurrently, if we don't have enough cores to sort of process them, then um, we're actually slower and maybe like I said, my guess is because we're trying to update the, because we have concurrent readers. Let's go look at the solution for lab two. Here's where we sit in a loop and we say each time you tr find a file to process, then create a generator and the generator will try to read data from that file and then call these functions and because our word conk function like i said splits a line and then for each word it has to lock the mutex um get a lock on the mutex um so it can update the map so this might actually be better if we do not lock the mutex for each word maybe if we put the lock outside for each line of text maybe and we do something like this and so we have a line of text we split it we get a lock and then we update it. So let's see if this is actually any better. So we run it. And actually look at that, it's 3.4. So just as I guess, trying to lock the mutex to each word, of course, that makes sense. So we can say that this is pretty much on par with our iterative solution. So, so far going the concurrent route versus the iterative route, we haven't seen any benefit, right? We come in consistently above three seconds, so three point something seconds. So let's now go over to section seven. 
and the solution there and then lab one and so let's see if this runs any better than the so if we try this um so this runs about 2.8 seconds milliseconds so not anything different than what we we're seeing for all of the implementation so far but here and now we again read in the input files concurrently but we pulled up the um how many functions we create and this is about six point something seconds and but remember we didn't change how we were accessing the map right so come in six plus seconds if we want to try something we can remove the mutex and see what happened and so let's do that in our next example and so the big difference here is that now we do not need to write concurrent to worry about concurrent access to a map because we have different maps for each goal routine that's the key we have a separate map for each goal routine and so let's see how fast is our implementation this time again this is still a concurrent solution but uh, let's try with uh, since we have star here let's try that and so of course we have more result but process and time wise it's less than half what we've been seeing so far the iterative solution or concurrent solution or best concurrent solution so far had been uh, three seconds and now we're just over one second consistently we're just over one second so we can say having separate maps at least make it faster because our previous implementation we went to not updating the map for every word but for every line and that was still about you know three seconds or something now we're consistently about one second and the final implementation or final thing we can try is to say what if we wanted to do like filtering what if we wanted to get rid of some of the noise words now let's see with that extra work is this significantly slower than the fastest one we've seen so far which is the one we're looking at so let's check at lab two and printing out all the result but remember we so not significant slower. so we have a point two milliseconds it looked like onto um, our process in time to, to be able to filter our noise work so not bad but we still um, in sub two seconds range we're still being able to process 15 files in less than two seconds and so this is not bad and so we can say so our concurrent approach at least now compared to what we we're doing before is faster than the iterative approach so we do see a benefit there it's just that we have to make sure that we don't do things like or we are careful when we how often we try to update share data structures like a map or how many functions calls we make it um, i'm pretty sure that if we put back in the function call for each word it's probably not going to be as bad here um, essentially that's what we're doing anyway we're sending the result of each line on a channel and then we have our word count is running as a separate function instead of calling it here so those are things we can try too to see that do we really need to send each line or file processor should it really be a generator or should it just you know uh, what should it return lines of text as its output or just words and maybe that's another optimization that might help speed up our code okay that's it for the lec in terms of covering the, the so-called labs and i'm using air quotes um, review the code is more what I want you to do than and run it and possibly try to tweak it than actually try to implement this from scratch because you would have to profile the code first to know where it's slow.